Good morning, and welcome back to the Disability Frame, the Volume 170 Symposium for the University of Pennsylvania Law Review. My name is Matthew Seelig. My pronouns are he, him, uh, and I'm a white man with glasses, blonde hair, a gray suit, and a blue tie. Uh, throughout this event, we've prioritized access and participation for everyone. So like yesterday, we are going to start with our access statement. We strive to be as inclusive as possible. And to that end, here's some information about how this event will go. Uh, we have ASL interpreters, uh, Donna and Joy, uh, and also manual closed captioning as standard accommodations for each panel and speaker throughout the symposium. I, I'd add that you can also pin uh, our ASL interpreters, uh, which will make them bigger on your screen. We will orally identify ourselves when we are speaking. And when we are speaking for the first time, we will describe our visual appearance like I did a few moments ago. Um, in all instances, we will state our name before we speak. And if a speaker shows a slide, they will describe and explain what is on the slide. We encourage participants to use plain language wherever possible and define acronyms or avoid using them altogether. We have a few channels by which to ask questions. Anybody may type a question in the Q&A tab, and that's the Q&A tab and not the chat. Um, we want to reserve the chat for um, access, technical, or, or logistical communications. Um, we'll have a moderator read the question uh, that, that you've put in the chat. Uh, unless if you would prefer to ask your question orally, you may indicate that you would like to do so in the body of your question, uh, or you may simply raise your electronic hand. We'll then allow you to unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, finally, we have a phone line where anyone can call in to ask a question. And that number is 215-898-7024. Uh, um, and you may also use this number uh, to, um, to make any accommodation requests or report technology issues. And, and then you can also alert us to any of those issues uh, via the chat again. Um, and again, just want to make that clear, the distinction between the Q&A, which is substantive questions for our panelists, uh, and, and the chat, which, which we want for those access uh, technical and logistical issues. Um, we uh, will post that statement in the chat. I think it is already there. Um, it's posted on our website and in our uh, Dropbox, and I'll, I'll post the link to the Dropbox momentarily. Um, I'd like to add that we've added a document to our Dropbox. There, uh, were so many questions coming out of the roundtable yesterday, and and I think there was some interest in like what are what are just some other questions that came out and and some thoughts, uh, you know, just to give us some a few things to think about going into the start of the day. Uh, that is in our Dropbox as well, and again, I'll uh, post that. Um, I, oh, it's already posted. Thank you, Erica. Um, we will have CLE, but we won't have any C uh, continuing legal education. Uh, we won't have any announcements related to that or any codes uh, until the start of our first panel at 10 o'clock. Um, now, you know, we, we had some great conversations yesterday and, and, and really enjoyed them and, and looking forward to today's. We've talked so much about um, disability universally, but we wanted to take a step back and recognize how disability is experienced here on the campus of Penn Law. Um, and this is a, a Penn Law student event, and, and we just wanted to Think about that because disability law has often not been offered here as a class and i've talked to some people who have experienced that with frustration in, in the past um and, and as the dean was saying yesterday it's often neglected in other areas where it deserves a spotlight like constitutional law or tort law um furthermore there, there are just many many aspects of the law school experience um physically or otherwise that are simply not accessible on unequal terms to all students um to that end, we want to recognize the Disabled and Allied Law Students Association, or DALSA, here at Penn Law. Um, it's, it's young among Penn's um, 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 student groups. Uh, it's in its second year, um, but it's had a strong presence on campus since its founding. Um, it acts as a network among students with disabilities, as well as those who want to fight for more access, um, and provides resources uh, for, for various parts of the law school experience, like classes and, and on-campus interviews. It also organizes some great events from, from social to informational to substantive law. Um, and and I, it's my pleasure to hand it over to Dulce's president, uh, Gwyneth Herrick, Herrick to uh, talk about the organization and, and the great work that it's doing. Gwyneth. 
Thank you so much, Matt. I am so excited to be here. Uh, my name is Gwyneth Herrick. Uh, as Matt mentioned, I'm the president of the Disabled and Allied Law Students Association. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a white woman with blonde hair and I'm wearing a black turtleneck sweater. So I'll start with why I started DALSA in the summer of 2020. Um, I am a person with a disability and I realized that I was entering a space where I needed to be accommodated for the first time. So this was pretty daunting for me. And I noticed that despite a very strong affinity group presence on campus, there was really no community for students with disabilities. On top of that, um, when COVID was sort of at the peak of being scary for us law students, I felt like the decisions that were being made about remote versus in-person instruction were disproportionately impacting students with disabilities, particularly immunocompromised individuals, and yet there was no body of students for the administration to consult. So to that end, me and my other founding board members um, decided to establish DALSA as a supportive community for students with disabilities. And we have accomplished many things since our founding, I'm proud to say. We have since built a listserv of over 60 students, hosted panels with disability rights lawyers. We have formed a partnership with Mo Riley in OCS um, in order to educate students about their rights in the workplace and how to go about having a conversation with your employer about your disability. We have recently secured sponsorship from one of the best law firms in the country who will be partnering with us to host a mock interview program with DALSA 1Ls. We've held community building lunches, created a database for students so that they can research professors and their accessibility reputations on campus. We've pitched accessibility concerns and recommendations to our faculty. And um, excitedly, we have gotten to know Professor Tani and Professor Harris, who have been wonderful allies to our community. Um, and despite all of these things that we've accomplished, there is a lot of work yet to be done. Our community has heard very uh, concerning stories from students with disabilities in our law school, ranging from failure to be accommodated to not even hearing back from our Student Disability Services Office about their accommodation. Um, we hope to work with the faculty to the faculty and administration to um, establish a disability expert on campus who students can work with. Um, we are also working with research librarians at the law school to research questions of accessibility in the classroom with the hope of presenting our findings to faculty in order to inform them of best practices. We will continue building relationships with other affinity groups and uh, empower students to join disability affinity networks within their schools and in the workplace. Um, like I said, there's much work to be done, but we just wanna say thank you to Law Review for shining a spotlight on this issue that's very near and dear to me. And thank you to my fellow board members for helping me get DALSA off the ground. Thanks. Thank you so much, Gwyneth. Um, I, I, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Professors Tani and, and uh, Professor, or Professor Tani going first, uh, uh, to, to um, uh, get things going, <laughs> Professor Tani. Thank you so much, Matt, and thank you, Gwyneth. Hi, my name is Karen Tani. I am an Asian American woman with short black hair, wearing a black top, black sweater, and a chunky green statement necklace. My virtual background is a view of the campus of the University of Pennsylvania, where I teach. I will begin my remarks with some thank yous. I will then say a few words about the symposium's core theme, and I will recap what happened on day one of the symposium. So first, thank yous. I want to thank again the student leaders at the Law Review for their hard work on this symposium. Planning an event of this scale while striving for accessibility is challenging. We are grateful for their labor and commitment. I also want to thank the participants from yesterday's panels and the attendees. People asked great questions and helped move the conversation forward. Turning now to the theme of the symposium, we have designed this event around the idea of the disability frame. 
Building on the work of colleagues, we define the disability frame as the characterization of a particular controversy or problem as being about disability. This in turn implies that disability focused laws ought to resolve or adjudicate the issue. So in other words, the disability frame involves taking a particular issue, something like mask mandates or immigration restrictions or police violence or poverty and choosing to talk about it as a disability issue rather than leaving the disability dimension unspoken or in the background. What we hope to highlight is that frames are choices rooted in hopes or assumptions about how a perceived audience may react. We want to highlight and interrogate these choices. Here are some questions that we flagged yesterday for people to think about. First, what do you think about our working definition of the disability frame? How might we refine that definition? Second, what do you think about the disability frame? Our symposium title suggests the words opportunities, costs, constraints as categories for thinking about this, but that is just a start. The big question here is, do you find the disability frame compelling, useful, promising, troubling? Is there a particular basis of knowledge or experience that informs your views? Third, we have tried to craft um, panels around um, the idea that we, we can't see and understand the disability frame without seeing it from different angles and perspectives. But we may have missed something. What have we missed? What work is left to do? I will now briefly recap what happened yesterday before turning things over to Professor Harris. So after introductory remarks, we heard a fantastic keynote speech from Representative Ayanna Presley. Her remarks were rich and wide ranging, but a core theme was the importance of disability justice. When she looks at an issue like healthcare or infrastructure or policing, she recognizes how these issues matter to people with disabilities. But another key theme was the importance of rejecting silos and boxes. She was firm in her recognition of intersectionality. She talked powerfully about the intersection of blackness and disability and how this intersection could lead to both hyper visibility and invisibility. She also encouraged the audience to see her as a resource and to hold her accountable and to recognize that power is with the people. The people lead, she said, and Congress follows. A recording of this keynote will eventually be available for those who missed it. Turning now to our first panel, this was a historical panel. I was on this panel along with Rabia Belt, Nate Holdren, and commentator Leah Samples. We asked, how has the disability frame been deployed in the past? Are there situations when this frame might have deployed, been deployed, but was not? If so, why? And with what consequence? So for example, my remarks were about a famous disability benefits case that was filed in the early 1980s and reached the Supreme Court in 1990. I talked about how poverty lawyers self-consciously expanded who counted as disabled with the goal of achieving greater economic security for more people. But I also raised questions about the downsides of expanding the welfare state in this way because of the potential harms of medicalization and surveillance. Panelists also showed us what happens when we look at particular topics such as voting rights and workers' compensation through the disability frame. This generates insights that previous historians of these topics have missed. Our second panel of the day was a round table featuring Jasmine Harris, Elizabeth Emmons, and Karen Gustafson. They had a wide ranging conversation about the idea of cost as it relates to disability rights and disability justice. They talked, for example, about the popular narrative that accessibility is costly. This includes the idea that opportunistic people use accessibility mandates to somehow profit at the expense of small businesses, also the idea that access comes at the expense of some imagined non-disabled taxpayer. Greater accessibility often benefits everyone, but panelists noted resistance to recognizing this truth. Panelists also talked about the reality that providing equal access is work and asked important questions about who is doing that work. Turning from access to policymaking more generally, the panelists also talked about the under-recognized costs that various policies impose on people with disabilities. 
Is there a way to get policymakers to tally these costs, they asked, and to recognize that certain policy choices impliedly cast certain people as valueless and expendable? I unfortunately cannot do justice to all that was said, um, but this is just a just a taste of what was covered. I also used my Twitter handle, it's at K-M-T-A-N-I, to highlight some other insights from this panel. So you can check out my feed for additional nuggets of wisdom. I will now give the floor to my colleague, Jasmine Harris, to talk about what we will expect for today. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Jasmine Harris and I'm a professor of law here at Penn. I'm a Latina with brown hair, brown eyes, and I'm wearing a necklace with a black shirt and a maroon scarf. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Thank you, Professor Tani, for reframing the disability frame again for us this morning and for recapping yesterday's rich discussions. And a special note of thanks to our West Coast participants who are sacrificing sleep, much needed sleep to be here with us this morning. We will keep this in mind for accessibility for future conferences. As Professor Tani said, today's program is the present and the future. Today's program moves us from discussions of the disabilities frames history and the salience of the cost narrative in its development and deployment in the, in the present and the future. First up, panel three situates the disability frame in contemporary law and society. Professors Iyer, Morgan, Oseawusu and Reynolds will offer contemporary manifestations of the disability frame and discuss the collateral consequences of its deployment. Yesterday's discussions aptly noted the potential for contradictory deployment or unintended consequences that may in effect undermine the anti-discrimination project writ large. However, is greater embrace of disability legal paradigms actually a sign of progress? That is the fact that it's malleable and broad, is this a good thing? A sign of broad reach and an example of innovation and normative shifts? This is a question to keep in mind for today. For example, in one of the most well-known and cited disability rights Supreme Court cases, Olmstead versus LC, in a majority opinion written by Justice Ruth Gator Bader Ginsburg, the court held that Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, it, that the, the court held that Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act's definition of disability discrimination Unnecessary, includes unnecessary institutionalization of people with disabilities. Olmstead, when read together with two regulations from the Department of Justice on Title II, produced what is known as the integration mandate at the heart of disability rights law. The integration mandate is that people with disabilities are to receive government services, programs, and benefits in the most integrated setting appropriate. Disability rights lawyers, or as Dean Michael Waterstone of Loyola LA has called them cause lawyers, have strategically helped shape the doctrinal expansion of Olmstead principles beyond the basic deinstitutionalization litigation. And by basic, I mean, classic to the facts of Olmstead. It's been expanded to such areas as sexual regulation, travel, housing, education, immigration, and prison abolition, as scholars like Jamelia Morgan, Beth Ribbett, Liat, Liat Ben Mosh, Shira Wachschlag, Bob Dinnerstein, Natalie Chin, and others have said. In fact, Olmstead has proved critical during this pandemic. And in February of 2020, I had the good fortune of working with the Penn Law Review editors to publish an essay, The Frailty of Disability Rights, that notes the critical potential of the Olmstead case to move people with disabilities who are living and exist in congregate care facilities into community settings that are safer and to frame it as a pandemic response. A forthcoming piece, Disability Law on the Front Lines, expands the argument around Olmstead and argues 
that Olmstead should continue to be a litigation tool for civil rights more broadly, particularly during the pandemic, as its breadth is the very core of its transformative potential. But what happens when disability law gets deployed without attention to its downstream consequences, particularly when those effects are unintended? They're not only unintended, but dangerous to the overall normative mission of disability justice. After we return from our lunch break today, panel four will offer a view of the disability frame from policy and practice. We are so excited to have these individuals and their expertise here to think collectively about and wrestle with these big questions. Experts on this panel will also offer reactions to the prior panel discussions, and we hope to challenge the utility and viability of the ideas we've discussed so far. Questions of professional responsibility tether a lawyer's interest to their client. How do these rules affect the scope of impact work and the ability of cause lawyers to consider and affect the downstream effects of the disability frame? Then our final panel of the day is forward-looking and highly normative. Given the breadth and utility of the disability frame in law and society and its collateral consequences, how should we be thinking about the disability frame moving forward? Once again, thank you for joining us today, and we hope that you will continue to participate in these discussions by asking questions in the Q&A function on Zoom. Your questions and comments have enriched this discussion tremendously. We've heard back from our participants, from our panelists, from audience members, that the questions themselves are incredibly rich. As Matt said this morning, because the questions have so much content, we wanted to share them with all of the participants uh, and the audience members. We hope you'll continue to participate that way. If we were in person, we, don't have, we wouldn't have the good fortune of having so many of you be able to share your ideas with us. This is a collective endeavor, and we're very grateful to all of you for being here. With that, I will turn it over to Matt to kick off the first panel of the day. Thank you all very much and look forward to today. Hi all, we're actually going to take a very brief break um, um, just to get a few things uh, set up for panel three, but we'll be back uh, to kick things off in time at 10 o'clock. We'll see everyone in a few minutes. <laughs> 